Doc Talk with Dr. Paul Conley is copyright 2021, Signer Foundation, and is solely responsible for the content. And now, Doc Talk, brought to you by Plateau Medical Center. Here's Dr. Paul Conley. Hello, I'm Dr. Paul Conley, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Doc Talk. I'm pleased to be here at the new Fayette County Health Department location as today was a signature day in which the rollout of vaccination for children ages five and above have been in, initiated as of today. And so I think this is something that's really astounding that when we think about where we were a year ago, we had no vaccine at all. And now here we are delivering vaccination for children ages five to 11 and actually five and up. So tonight I have a couple special guests with me. One is Dr. Brad Marple, farthest to my left, who's actually a pediatrician at Montgomery General Hospital. We also have Dr. Jessica Swank, who's a family practitioner who treats adults and children. And we have Dr. Nina Stewart, the Fayette County Health Department Health Officer. And so I appreciate all of you guys coming on the show tonight because first of all, um, this is something that's revolutionary. We've never had one a COVID-19 vaccine and we've never had one uh, for the children. I think this is something where a lot of parents have been really, really, in a sense, wringing their hands, you know, waiting for this to come out because there's been so much concern about the children who up until now, you know, have really been at the mercy of us adults to receive the vaccine and the children basically could not receive the vaccine until now. So I guess, you know, I just want to go over a little bit about uh, why it's so important uh, that we really consider uh, the children receiving the vaccine. And, you know, I know Dr. Stewart, you know, we had talked even before the broadcast, you know, we talk about the ages of five to 11, that actually reflects 28 million uh, people in this country. And so that's a big number. And so maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, why it's so important these 28 million uh, receive the vaccine. Yeah, so I think initially when we started to see COVID cases in the United States, um, we predominantly didn't see a lot of pediatric infections. However, with this last Delta surge, we saw a very large increase, um, particularly in the five to 11 year old age group. That was actually the driver, 38% um, across the United States um, of those new cases were in that age group. Uh, we had 1.9 million COVID cases in the five to 11 year old age groups. And it caused significant um, morbidity and mortality, unfortunately, for for some, and up, we had 94 deaths and over 2,000 um, with uh, multi-inflammatory syndrome in children. Yeah, right, and, and one of the things I was looking at the CDC website was like 8,300 hospitalizations. And so when we think about, again, hospitalizations, uh, that's not a small number to have 8,300 kids that required hospitalization. And then, yeah, I keep, you know, I think we unfortunately think about COVID at, two boxes we either put you in the box where uh, you didn't recover and that's a death or you did recover but the actuality is like you know this you know 8300 hospitalizations you had 2316 and that number of course i'm sure is higher uh this multi-system inflammatory syndrome so for the viewers what exactly is a multi-system inflammatory syndrome dr swank what, what does that what does that actually mean so this is occurring in kids who have already seemingly recovered from COVID and then down the road they're getting an inflammatory process that can affect many organs, you know, multi-organ. So it can affect the heart, the lungs, the skin. Um, and, and again, these are the kids that, that fell into the bucket, as you pointed out, that they survived COVID and yet they're still having issues um, down the road far after recovery. So this could be um, this could be a kid who maybe is on the basketball team who who contracts COVID and now is having a really hard time competing because either they can't breathe or they've had some inflammation of their, their, their skin, their eyes, kidneys, lungs, GI tract. And so I think, you know, we're learning more and more that, you know, COVID is something that, you know, provides a systemic effect and can cause, you know, inflammation of so many different organs. Um, you know, speaking of the uh, inflammation of the heart, I know, uh, and maybe this is a good question for Dr. Marple, our pediatrician. You know, uh, myocarditis, I know there's parents out there that um, are concerned because I know that when we looked at 
um, you know, the vaccination from 12 to 17 year olds. There was uh, some issues with myocarditis. Uh, although the number was very small, it was like 54, like 1 million cases, which gives you a percentage of like 0.005. And your, your chance of getting struck by lightning are actually higher at 0.007. So, but, but, but reality is, is, you know, when that's out there, people are concerned. Maybe you can tell us what is myocarditis and pericarditis. Um, and with this age group, 5 to 11, did they even see that uh, with these children? All right. Yeah, so myocarditis and pericarditis, it's basically in, you know, lay, lay terms, it's an inflammation of the heart. And it's seen with a lot of viral infections, including influenza, COVID, uh, pretty much any, you know, virus you can get. Um, and it is pretty rare, but it can also cause a lot of morbidity, mortality, and be very serious and, you know, cause kids to, you know, unfortunately pass away. And that's just something we, we really don't like to see in the pediatric age group. But with the vaccine, I think, you know, there was some concern, Dr. Stewart, right. that, uh, you know, the vaccine could cause myocarditis and pericarditis. But, but these, but what that very small number, um, I mean, these kids ultimately, they did recover, correct? So, I mean, it's right. a very, very rare potential and, side effect. And so in the studies, too, in those 5 to 11-year-olds, which myocarditis is less common in kids in that age, even at baseline, compared to older kids. But in the vaccine study, the Pfizer vaccine, there were over 3,000 kids who received the, who were in the vaccine arm, meaning they got the actual vaccine, and there were no cases of myocarditis in that study. So that's really reassuring, um, both that at baseline, that age kid is less likely to get myocarditis, and then in this study, there were no cases related to the vaccine. So it's really reassuring from a safety standpoint with and the it, vaccine in that age group. And to Dr. Marple's point, you know, if you get myocarditis from COVID uh, or an infection, you know, that we could prevent, such as COVID with the vaccine, uh, the adverse sequela is, is different than that very, very small percent chance of receiving myocarditis. Uh, and again, that was from the ages of 12 to 17. And again, statistically, it was 54 and 1 million, which again is 0 0.005. And I happened to do a little Google search and your chances of getting struck by lightning are just a little bit higher so <laughs> so so it's next to very negligible of this and again of those um, they all recovered so you know dr. Stewart, before the broadcast we were talking too about um, if a parent you know comes to you and says you know really seriously you know why, why should my child receive this vaccine uh, we know that their risk is ultimately lower than, than adults or people that have uh, you know serious illness you know, why would you tell that parent uh, that they really should get their child vaccinated? Yes, so, you know, I think that with parents, it's not only the science that you have to talk about, but, you know, we have to talk, you know, speak to the emotions. We know as parents, this is something that's new. Um, everybody's a little bit nervous and scared and anxious, um, but I think it's, it's really important to know that this has been well studied and um, that there's good evidence that these are safe and effective vaccines. Um, the other thing that we know is that COVID does affect this age group. And in fact, it's one of the six leading causes of death in, in this five to 11 year old age group this year. And so it is not um, a benign thing just having the COVID infection. The other thing besides these direct effects that we know of COVID is, is also the indirect effects. So, you know, kids are missing school. They're missing out on, you know, developmentally appropriate activities. They're missing out on all these social things that they really need. Um, you know, all of the mental health side effects that we're seeing from this. Um, I, I just think that um, to really get kids back to baseline to not only protect themselves, um, both physically from COVID and then mentally, emotionally um, from the other indirect effects, um, but also to protect our communities um, that the safest thing and the most effective thing is for vaccination. So, uh, um, Dr. Marple, I'm going to throw this out there because you'd mentioned this too as well. Um, you know, are you seeing, um, which I think, you know, statistically we are, but are you seeing this in children, uh, anxiety, uh, depression? You know, you know, I treat adults and I know in my practice most definitely I've seen that, but, you know, sometimes I, you know, think as kids being happy-go-lucky and they're out playing and watching cartoons but you know before the broadcast you were saying that 
that you're seeing quite a bit of depression in this age group. So, so tell me a little bit about what you're seeing. Yeah, so <clears throat> unfortunately we are seeing uh, the number of cases of both depression and anxiety really skyrocket. And, and it's hard to say if it's just from COVID. I'm sure there's, uh, you know, like a lot of the, I think in general the pandemic ha has made it a lot worse. But these kids, like, the, you know, they, they need interaction with other kids and like to go to school and to play basketball, football, soccer, you know, just to live normal, normal life. And if we take that away as well, it just, it seems like we've been seeing a, a lot more cases. And on the flip side, we don't have anywhere to send them. There's just, you know, a lack of mental health, you know, care in this area. I mean, I, th I think not only is there a shortage of mental health, I think that's something we've dealt with um, for quite some time. But I think, you know, again, like I said, I, I do know uh, we're talking to uh, some of my colleagues, you know, um, you know, in, in psychiatry, we've talked a little bit about, you know, mental health. And, and I think because one, hospitals are short staffed, we have nursing shortage, we have physician shortage, but then when you have so many of the adults also, uh, you know, they're having mental health issues. I think, you know, it's just, like you said, I think the kids sometimes, you know, get, get left out, which, which is very unfortunate because, again, I think you just think, well, you know, kids, you know, they're resilient, uh, you know, just throw them some cartoons and, and they'll be fine. But I think the reality is, is that, like you said, that's, that's not the case. And, uh, you know, again, with I think, you know, Dr. Swank, you know, you'd mentioned too about, you know, just missing school. I think, you know, 2020, and, and maybe we haven't quite seen exactly what that's going to mean, you know, for these kids. So maybe you can comment a little bit about just being quarantined over and over and over again and what you've seen in your practice with that. Sure. Yeah, this is definitely the ripple effect of COVID. Kids being out of school, schools being canceled. Um, we already talked about the summer slide prior to COVID, you know, that, that there would be such a lag with kids in the summer and now we're talking six months of that. And then it's so disruptive for kids to be quarantined time and time again during the school year. Switching to virtual um, just has a huge impact on both their social and emotional health, but also their education, um, not to mention sports. You know, we're getting into winter sports, which tend to be indoor sports. So I think vaccinating this age group just helps accelerate the decrease in cases and allows us to safely return to indoor winter sports, which are big for a lot of kids' emotional health. Right, and I think, like you said, I mean, you know, we've had actually two million, um, two million of this age group that's had COVID. So, so again, it's not as if these, you know, kids haven't been uh, affected by this. Not only, like you said, emotionally, either with their parents or their siblings, but again, I mean, you know, one of the ways that we can protect siblings that are under the age of five, because, you know, this five-year-old may have a four-year-old or a three-year-old that's also in the house, and guess what? They're still having to wear a mask, and and again, to protect a little brother, a little sister, you know, it's very, very important that, you know, these kids between ages of five and 11, or actually children five and up, um, you know, receive the vaccine, because many of these kids, um, you know, they, ha they have a younger sibling that's in the home. So it looks like we're coming up against the break already. Um, a lot of good information right here, guys. But um, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to go over not only some additional things with the vaccine, we're going to talk about the nuances of the vaccine. And we're also going to talk about the importance, again, about getting these children vaccinated and the safety. And we'll actually even go over some of the common myths of the vaccine. And we'll talk about the safety of the vaccine. So we're going to take a commercial break. So you folks stay tuned, and we'll be right back. Doc Talk with Dr. Paul Conley is a production of the Signer Foundation, which is solely responsible for the content. Welcome back to Doc Talk. I'm Dr. Paul Conley, and we are here at the new Fayette County Health Department. Uh, and we've been talking about COVID vaccination in the children between ages of 5 to 11. Just, just recently got approved and we're just rolling out the vaccine as of today and we've been talking a little bit about the benefits of this vaccine 
And, you know, one of the things that, you know, you were just talking about, Dr. Stewart, is about, you know, how beneficial uh, vaccines are in general. When we think about measles, mumps, rubella, we think about childhood vaccinations. And I was even talking about the break, how I'm old enough when we talked about children, you know, varicella. We all got chicken pox. And now, you know, you start thinking about it. I don't know the last time that I saw a child with chicken pox. So, again, vaccinations, you know, are, are something that we can prevent illness. And, and I think, you know, parents will feel so much better knowing that their that their children are safe. And, you know, speaking, speaking of that, um, you know, this vaccine that we're talking about for children, I, I know that the, that the researchers, the Food and Drug Administration, the CDC have really, really been paying close attention to this. And so in saying that, this vaccine is a little bit different than the adult vaccine. And so this may give some reassurance to the parents as well. So, so Dr. Swank, you're talking about the, the, the effects of the vaccine, how minimal they are, and maybe you guys can talk a little bit about the formulation of the vaccine. So go ahead, Dr. Swank, because I know you're saying that what you've seen is very minimal um, you know, issues at all once a child receives a shot. Yeah, I was surprised by the low percentage of the adverse effects that we expect. So the common ones were um, just pain at the injection site, fatigue, headache, similar to what we saw with the um, older kids, but it was less than 3% of kids who even experienced that. And that was all in 24 to 48 hours, um, possibly because it is a lower dose that, that we're using in this age kids, a third of the dose that was given to 12 years and, and up. But um, I was surprised at, at the small percentage who were even having those pretty common adverse events. So speaking about that, Dr. Stewart, um, you know, so, so they, uh, again, I mean, I think these vaccines have really been scrutinized, okay, for safety. And I know that that's one thing about, you know, our Food and Drug Administration is they want to make sure this is safe. And, and with this vaccine, um, maybe you can tell me a little bit. So, so it's not the adult dose. So, so don't run out and get the adult dose. This has been formulated specifically for kids. It's not about weight. It's more about age, correct? Yeah, correct. So this follows the same protocol as other vaccinations. Um, these are all age-based vaccinations. So um, this formulation, it's going to be in an orange, have an orange cap. Um, it is um, concentrated specifically for the 5 to 11 year old age group. It's a less of a concentration. So they did, you know, rigorous studies looking at, you know, exactly what the right dose was um, with the most um, or the minimal side effects um, with the max effectiveness. And at the dose um, that we're giving for this age group, it's 91% effective at preventing COVID. So, I mean, that, that to me is amazing. Um, you know, we know that, especially in the adult world, that, you know, if you uh, are unvaccinated and contract COVID, you have an 11 times greater risk of dying than if you're vaccinated. Again, you know, what we're seeing in the hospitalizations and, and what we're seeing is unvaccinated. And again, when you take a look at these 8,300 hospitalizations, it's because these children, they couldn't be vaccinated. And so, you know, they unfortunately, you know, uh, were at the mercy of us adults. And so, uh, you know, I just think about, you know, how few people or children would have been, you know, hospitalized if we had a vaccine, but we do now. So speaking of that, Dr. Marple, I know one of the things that you talked about in, in, your, in your practice is, is, you know, unfortunately, some of these kids have already contracted COVID. Uh, either through a sibling or through a parent bringing it home to them uh, or maybe a classmate or what have you. And so now the parent says, now why should my child receive the vaccine or even should they receive the vaccine if they've already had COVID, do they still need to be vaccinated? Yes, <clears throat> that's a really common question we get in, you know, just everyday practice. Um, in, in reality, the natural immunity lasts about anywhere from three to six months. and. What we found is that when, you know, after kids have had uh, COVID and after the adults have had COVID, we really recommend that they get the vaccine shortly after they, you know, um, improve from COVID, anywhere from two to four weeks afterwards. So it, it really is recommended that they still get the COVID vaccine. So, so you have a child in, in coming in your clinic and, and they're coming in for their childhood vaccination. So whether it be their MMR, whether it be varicella, whether it be um, flu, because, you know, currently we're right in the midst of a flu season or, or getting ready to enter into that. Um, 
are, can they get the vaccine at the same time? I know we've talked about, you know, adults are receiving the flu vaccine and COVID vaccine simultaneously. Is that something that these kids uh, also can be afforded? Yes, yeah, so actually, they, um, the CDC recently just came out, or I guess a couple of months ago, came out with a statement that said that when kids and adults need, you know, two or multiple vaccines at the same time, not to delay vaccines, you know, continue to get your COVID vaccine, your flu vaccine, as well as the, um, the multiple vaccines that they get on the routine schedule. So, you know, I, I think uh, we, we've talked about, you know, different uh, myths uh, about the vaccine uh, or vaccines in general. So this is Pfizer, right, that's been approved. So it's not Moderna, it's not J&J. &J. Uh, so this is a mRNA vaccine. So, you know, one of the questions is as well, if my child receives the vaccine, uh, could they somehow give COVID uh, to a family member? Is there any virus particle in this vaccine, Dr. Stewart? Yeah, so there are no viral particles in the mRNA vaccines. It cannot change your DNA. Um, it basically acts as like a blueprint. So you think about building a building. Um, it basically makes a blueprint that your body learns to build antibodies to help keep you safe if you were exposed to COVID. So, you know, one of the other, you know, myths is, is that, uh, you know, this is, it can affect, you know, I think a lot of parents are concerned about uh, the 5 to 11 age group, uh, their uh, ability to, for menses and menstrual periods and pregnancy and fertility. Um, has there been any proof or any day at all showing that these vaccines would cause any issues with that at all? No, um, there's been no proof of that. And in fact, these vaccines are fully recommended by the American um, College of Obstetrics and Gynecology and um, the Maternal Fetal Medicine um, Society. And, and we certainly would recommend that anyone, um, all females be vaccinated. Um, and, and women that are of childbearing age, we know that um, COVID adversely affects them and they are more likely to have um, increased morbidity and mortality if they would contract COVID. So frankly, um, all women uh, should have this vaccine. Yeah, and, and I know one of the shows you had brought up is the fact that, that as, again, as, again, that we do have vaccine now for ages five to 11. On the flip side of that coin, we don't have vaccine for children younger than that. And I know one of the things you had brought up was that as a pregnant mother, that you are at increased risk of adverse event if you contract COVID. But you had mentioned that these antibodies, maternal fetal antibodies are transmitted to your newborn child and your newborn child may have some protection from the mother being vaccinated, is, is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. And, and again, we're certainly recommending vaccination um, during pregnancy. Um, only about a third of women that are childbearing age are vaccinated. So we've got to do better. Um, we've got to get women vaccinated to protect not only themselves, but also um, the child um, as it's when it's born. So, you know, I guess, Dr. Marple, you know, with you being the pediatrician here in the room, um, you know, what are some of the concerns or questions um, that you're hearing from parents that, uh, you know, uh, would possibly prevent them from, from receiving the vaccine themselves or, or actually with their children? Yeah, so I think, you know, dealing with this on a day-to-day -day basis, the, the biggest thing I hear from parents is, you know, I've had COVID, my, my kids recently re recovered from COVID, you know, should we get the vaccine? And like we talked about a little, little bit ago, like, in fact, they should. Um, and the, the biggest thing is we're trying to push that um, amongst other things. Um, you know, and we hear a lot more, but that's really the biggest thing that I'm hearing. You know, one of the things, um, and I know we're getting ready to close out the show, it's, it's so fast, but, uh, you know, I've been pushing monoclonals really hard because, you know, we do know that the, that the folks that are eligible for monoclonals uh, definitely does decrease, you know, their risk of serious illness. But the five to 11 year olds, tell me about that. Are, are they even eligible for monoclonals? And so again, if, if, if they're not, you know, again, maybe that stresses the importance of being vaccinated. So tell me about that. Yeah, so you're right. Um, there is not um, emergency use authorization under the age of 12. So this five to 11 age group, which again is driving the spread of the virus right now um, and causing high, high viral um, 
um, prevalence in our communities, um, this group is not eligible for that therapy. So Dr. Swank, um, as we get ready to close, I mean, we're coming up on, um, as you said, indoor activities, uh, which not only include athletic events, but Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, you know, again, this time last year, we, we were talking about how we're going to try to social distance, uh, keep, you know, windows open, try to ventilate, uh, not sit too long at the dinner table, and basically, we basically discourage even having get-togethers at all. So, so this may be something that it's, again, we can maybe have some sense of normalcy because, um, correct me if I'm wrong, if everyone in, in the household is vaccinated for these holiday events, including these children, um, you know, they can actually, we can maybe get back to some sense of normalcy and, and enjoy the holidays, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. Um, last year, we were discouraging people getting together, and this year, we have a solution to that. It's not 100%, but... Um, greatly decrease, decreases the risk of spread by vaccinating the entire family um, and allow us to return to more normal life. Dr. Marple, Dr. Swank, Dr. Stewart, I really appreciate you folks for coming on and giving us this update. I uh, appreciate you coming on. Uh, we'll definitely want to do this again as we continue to get further and further updates. So we're at the end of the, of the show. I'm Dr. Paul Connie. You've been watching Doc Talk, and until next time, have a good night.